Hello and welcome to today's Future Ready webinar. I'm Tom Murray, the Director of Innovation for Future Ready Schools, a project of the Alliance for Excellent Education located in Washington, DC. Future Ready Schools is a collaboration between the Alliance and a vast coalition of over 60 other national and regional organizations. The goal of Future Ready Schools is to maximize learning opportunities and to help school districts move quickly towards student-centered learning. The effort provides districts with resources and support to ensure that local technology and digital learning plans align with instructional best practices, are implemented by highly trained teachers, and maximize learner-centered experiences for all students, particularly those from traditionally underserved communities. Future Ready Schools would like to thank Kanika Minolta, one of our great Future Ready partners, for sponsoring today's webinar. The hashtag for today's event is Future Ready. Thank you for making an investment and joining us today. I'm going to be your host on this webinar on creating career and technical education pathways that support equitable opportunities. With me today, and I am so excited, are two amazing educators from California, Michael McCormick and Doug Henderson. So let's do some quick introductions. It's an honor to have you both here today. Mike, let's start with you. Go ahead and introduce yourself if you could. Yeah, hey everybody, Mike McCormick, Superintendent of the Valverde Unified School District. And uh, just want to say, Tom, thanks so much to you and the Future Ready crew and the Alliance for Education to uh, invite us to this space. We're super excited to share. Great, and Doug, over to you. Yeah, Doug Henderson, the Director of STEAM for Valverde Unified and in charge of all CTE pathways and excited to talk about some of the cool stuff that we've been doing out here in California. Awesome, and I've seen some of that firsthand. I see you guys sharing like crazy on social media. And most importantly, I really see the incredible learner-centered work that you're doing. So I just wanna start by saying how much I respect the amazing work that's happening in Valverde. You know, I'm seeing these tremendous things in your district and the work that your team is leading. So Mike, let's start with you as the superintendent. Can you share a little bit of an overview of the district and some of the programs you have all in place so our viewers get a feel for Valverde? Yeah, I'd love to do that. Thanks so much. So, you know, Valverde Unified School District in California, we'd be considered a mid-sized school district. We're right around 20,000 students. And we serve a very diverse community of scholars. We're about 75% of our students are Hispanic. I think it's about 13% uh, African American. About a fifth of our students are learning English as a second language. And approximately 83% of our students participate in the National School Lunch Program. And so one of the things that's really a kind of a driving force for us and has been for many, many years is how do we provide access and opportunity to all of our scholars? And I think some of those things are paying off. Some of the, the key performance indicators that we track and like many of the folks that are, that are on the line with us today also track as our high school graduation rate. So in California, we're actually updated the, uh, from what you see on the slide there. I think we're about 90, 90, 95.2. And um, that's a four-year cohort graduation rate for California. So we start tracking that um, as the students come into high school. Also our college going rate, and you can see our PSAT and our SAT rates. So we're a school day SAT district, uh, pay for that for all of our students. Students can also take the uh, AP test for $5. And so again, we're, we're really trying to do some things to uh, capture access and opportunity. And so that's, uh, that's kind of the, the key there. And the other thing I wanna say that really serves as our North Star for our district is our portrait of a graduate. And um, the nice thing about the portrait of a graduate is it really takes into account, you know, the four C's. And you've probably heard a lot about the four C's. We actually added uh, another one, which is uh, flexibility. And so this kind of serving as our North Star really orients the system. And what we try to do is make sure that all the programs and services that we're offering really always point back to our portrait of a graduate. And so we have these posted at certainly at all of our high schools, but also at our middle schools and our elementary schools, because we think that these are the transferable skills and dispositions that our students are going to need. And I'll tell you, this has certainly been accelerated by this pandemic that we're in. Uh, in fact, I often like to say that 
you know, solving this pandemic is like the four C's for the adults. And so, because we know that anytime we're doing something or we're, we're coming together to try and solve one of those seemingly intractable challenges that face us, it requires communication, collaboration, critical thinking, creativity, and a whole lot of flexibility. So uh, this is something that we're very excited about and we always try and keep at the forefront of our mind. Yeah, and one of the things, you know, just to jump in there, if I could real quick before I turn it back over to you, you've said a phrase that I've latched on to multiple times and that's access and opportunity. And when we look at equity from a future ready end, that access and opportunity is so core to our work. And so the, the thing that I'm fascinated with when we look at our numbers is, you know, having been a district leader myself, it's so easy to make excuses. It's so easy to say, well, you know, our kids aren't going to be ready for that. Like, you know, our poverty rate's going to be too high for that. You know, we're not going to be able to do that because we have too many languages spoken and they're not going to be able to, parents wouldn't be able to understand. And so kudos to you all, because you have all of those metrics in place to make every excuse in the world, but yet what is leadership do leadership says like that's why we're going to do it because our students need it and all students need opportunity and so on behalf of future ready just kudos to seeing those things and the increases that you've seen there so sorry to interject but i just felt the need to uh, to give you guys that no we we appreciate that that's uh yeah we take that to heart i mean that's you know and one of the things i will say that's kind of been the spirit of this access as we think about you know this transition to distance learning and that's been a huge mindset shift for our teachers and our students and really the entire system. One of the things we did a couple of years ago is we, we went with a dark fiber network uh, in the district. And one of the things we're looking at now is how do we provide a private LTE network? Um, because we wanna make sure that our kids have the tools and the access to be able to, to still get a high quality education regardless of whether we're face-to-face -face or in distance learning mode. And by the way, that applies to our career and technical education uh, program as well. And so if we go to the next slide, Doug, um, one of the things that, that we've, we've done, and this is busy, I, I realize that, but it's, it's really a, a marketing material for us, which talks about all of our pathways that we offer where they're offered at, and what are kind of the industry standards and certifications that go along with these things. And so it's something we're, we're very proud of. We, Doug Henderson, who you're gonna hear from momentarily, has done just a, a phenomenal job in growing our career and technical education pathways. And one of the philosophies that we've used with this too is that uh, all of our career and technical education courses are also approved for university uh, kind of a pathway credit. And so in California, we have this thing called the A through G requirement, which if students take these sequence of courses, uh, that along with some other criteria automatically qualifies them for entrance into our University of California system. And so Doug will spend a little bit more time talking about, you know, what that means and what it helps for us is students don't have to necessarily make that same choice. Do I go CTE or do I go college ready? Uh, this is really a blending of those two things and how that works in the master schedule. We'll get into some more detail, but I want to spend just a little time, I think on the next slide, talking about the amazing growth that we've had in the number of pathways we offer. So back in 15, 16, we had 20 pathways. 19, 20, we've doubled that. We're now at 41 pathways. And you can kind of see the breakdown there of, of where we're doing this. And some of the pathways are offered across all of our high schools and others are focused on particular high schools. But some of those ones that have been really um, targeted to what industry in our area looks like has been a great thing um, for the way that we can develop future workers um, with experiences that we're giving them here in Valverde. That's awesome, Mike. And when I look at that and I look at the number of overall pathways, I mean, you've doubled the number of pathways that you have in the past five years. And that's an incredible feat. I mean, I working with districts all over the country, I know, and they should be proud, but they're proud. They've got one or they've got two. Like you have 41 pathways and obviously you're a good sized district when it comes to that. But 
that doesn't happen without intention and that doesn't happen without a vision. Like those things don't randomly happen to create these unique pathways. Talk to us a little about why you've been increasing those pathways and you know, really what's come out of that expansion. Yeah, I'll kind of kick us off and then I'm gonna turn it over to Doug who's really been front and center in this. But I will tell you that there's, there's certain pathways that have developed out of our communications and linkages with the industry uh, in our area. And um, you know that should always kind of be one of the starting points when you're thinking about your pathways is what you, you have to think about this in your local context. So for us, we've got two Amazon fulfillment centers that are located within the district boundaries. We've got lots of manufacturing and distribution centers. And then when we think about it, we're uh, also doing a lot with engineering. Uh, we're very close. Uh, in fact, a, part, a portion of uh, an air reserve base is within our district where they're doing a lot of things with uh, aeronautical engineering. And so those are the kinds of high skill, high wage jobs that we want to make sure our students have an introduction to what it takes for them to be successful. And so Doug, I'm going to kick it over to you, sir. Sure. So a circle there, you'll see those are the those are the ones that we really um, started to focus on when we started increasing our pathways because we found that in our local workforce, these are the areas that there were deficiencies. And so basically the, the need came about because we started realizing, are we truly preparing our kids for jobs in our local area? Because we don't want any brain drain, let's keep them close. So we started growing and started focusing on those things. So the, the, the first thing we started looking at was, well, what do they need? So I started touring plants and I started looking around and they would tell me we need CNC mills, we need CNC uh, lathes, we need welders. Turns out there's a huge shortage on welders. Um, started finding like all these technical skills that they were needing and, would, and I said, okay, well, how can I solve that issue? So I started looking into well, where can we bring these into the classrooms? How do we solve these issues for our local workforce? Then. That was, that was job number one, identify the skills that are needed, then find out how are we going to do it. So then that's when we started partnering with our community college district. Marina Valley College is our local college, worked a lot with them, started looking into how can they can uh, support us. And they have a lot of contacts. They bring a lot of people to the table to come talk about technical skills that are needed in the classroom. And then they uh, the state created something called the K-12 Strong Workforce. And so the community college districts were huge in this, looking into identifying and making it public the skills that we're targeting. One of them was cybersecurity. So we put in a brand new cybersecurity program. Uh, we have a manufacturer, advanced manufacturing that runs all of these, um, even construction, because that's a, that's a high job uh, thing in our area. And, did, and an entire welding program where we're certifying welders because there's a huge national shortage on those. So in a partnership with uh, our community colleges, we started putting this whole program together. Then, um, then it was after finding out exactly in the research that I needed to find out what were the skills, how do we as a district now solve that? So it was equipment needs. It was teacher credentialing. It's all those things. Where do we find all the stuff to be able to make all these happen? So then I started bringing the, the industry to come sit with us. So UPS was one of our partners that came in and they said to us, listen, we need students that can be electrical troubleshooters. This is the exact words they use. And I said, I don't know what you mean. That's confusing. What do you mean? Well, it turns out all these machines you see in these pictures, uh, when they break down, they want someone, normally it's an electrical issue. Can someone read a ladder diagram and get that thing being back up and running? And I said, oh, that I can do. So we are teaching ladder diagrams. We are um, teaching those in our advanced manufacturing and UPS has sat with our teachers multiple times to come up with what it is they need to be taught in class. And then AMRO is a, uh, they make tools for Boeing. They have parts going into space, but that big tool you see in the top left is uh, one of the big tools for making an airplane. And they built that right here. That's March Air Force Base right next to us. They're close to us. And they need welders like you would not believe. So we're, that's one of our partners. And they've been dictating curricula as we go the entire time. So that was kind of our, our need and the industry need drove everything. 
You know, Doug, just listening to you talk, I'm getting chills as I think about like so much of Future Ready we talk about from a learning end is the relevance for kids. And, you know, I remember teaching and how many times have we all heard as educators like, why are we learning this? Why are we learning this? Why are we learning this? You know, that age old question. And I've always said like that really boils down to like, maybe it's just a really good question. And maybe we should look at some of the things that we learn and why we learn it and the way we learn it. But you talk about the relevance. If I'm a student in one of your programs and it's saying like, well, when I finish this, I'm going to get to go work right over over there, that keeps relevance at the forefront. Or if I'm hearing from the people that, hey, that's my neighbor that's coming in to present tomorrow because he runs this distribution center and that's why we're learning it here, that relevance is totally front and center. And the other thing that I'll say, you know, when we look at the Future Ready framework, you know, and I know that's something that you all have used in your different in districts in different ways, it's looking at this notion of community partnerships. And sometimes we look at it and folks will say like, well, we're sharing out our information, we're giving the information to our community, but this is a whole other level of what do you need and how do we meet your need as a school district to prepare our kids for opportunities moving forward. And so again, kudos to you in that work and just the incredible opportunities, real world skills that our kids have in your district there. So thank you so much for sharing that. You know, let I me jump in, let yeah, me jump in ahead, real quick do. and also point out that one of the things that I also, also always tell them is for them to be in the background making curriculum decisions isn't as helpful as if they walk in that classroom and it says UPS on their shirt and they say, here's the skills I need you to do and I can hire you when you graduate. So we also try to get some of that happening so that it's, it is real, it is tangible. They understand there's a job waiting for them or um, they can make choices. They can go get their engineering degree and then still go work for UPS or whatever. There's lots of options. Yeah, so I gotta ask you this question. Like I'm putting my, my, you know, my secondary principal hat back on and I'm thinking about all the moving parts to make something like this happen. So how do you, when you double the amount of courses and you have these pathways, how does that impact the master schedule? Or heck, how does that impact? You can't just say, hey, let's take this average first grade teacher over here and she's gonna go teach you know, uh, the distribution of materials because like, you need some certified people or you need people that really have an understanding of what that industry does. So like, talk to us about what that looks like from a scheduling end or like just the people that you get to actually teach the work. So the first thing is, is, the, is the master schedule. So when you start looking at a master schedule, you know that the the tough parts are going to be a singleton course where there's only one section of it and then having way too many electives. So the problem is CTE tends to fall under the electives when it comes to going to college. So we, it's an A through G like Mike mentioned in California. So those things that count towards college most often gets dumped into the elective category. So the first thing we tackled was how many years do we want to try to make into a pathway? A lot of our traditional uh, academies or something like that is a four-year pathway. You come as a freshman and you're in welding one, then there's welding two, and then there's, and it kind of builds this entire thing. That will wreak havoc with 41 uh, four-year pathways. There's no way we're gonna be able to schedule that. So it was, okay, a two-year pathway satisfies the 300-hour requirement for a CTE pathway. So we started streamlining everything into two-year pathways. So you get way more completers, they still have time to get their industry certifications. They work on it in two years um, and they still come out with that career aspect. It's not just a, you know, like a biology classroom like that. It's, it's ag bio and we're tying that to something. So we do have no four year pathways right now. We have a few three year pathways, pathways because the ag program is really, really tough to try to get into, um, into two years. So that one is one of our three year pathways. The second thing was, was then making sure we can double dip. So now if I have an ag class, it's now a D, it's a lab science, right? So in California, it's going to count as a lab science towards going to college. So we have made all of our comprehensive high schools, every one of our CTE pathways is accomplishing a requirement for college. So it's not just an elective. It can be computer science, it's lab science, it's um, fi uh, fine arts, um, all, those, all those categories. We can satisfy them so a kid is actually getting a college course ready to go and doing their CTE program at the same time. So that was some of the things that we did. So if you double dip and there's never a singleton type course, then it's a lot easier to get people in. So those were the two biggest things we started from in that approach to make sure yeah, all that, kids were in. That makes, it makes a lot of sense, Doug. And I'm thinking about this from a student end and I'm thinking, you know, on one hand, uh, how much obviously before COVID hit, how much was like student debt and the student debt crisis in the news and here you're giving kids that are leaving you walking to somewhere, getting a paycheck a week or two after graduation and not walking out, getting all this debt and then having no idea what they want to do down the road. 
And so like, what a different opportunity moving forward. I mean, that's, that's generational when it can come to changing family trees and those kinds of things there too. And so just the support there long-term is awesome. When I mentioned students, one of the things that I'm thinking about though, is you obviously wouldn't do this type of program and expand this type of program if there was a lack of student interest or the feedback just well, it wasn't relevant, nobody was looking for it. So how have students responded, especially as you've, you've you know, altered and, and grown these pathways? So I'll answer that in just one sec. I remembered I forgot to answer the first second after your question, which was where do I find all my CTE teachers? So one of the biggest things is that what you do is if you have some conversations with teachers, you will find that there is a high number of teachers that this is their second career. And they're like, oh, well, for 10 years, I was programming computers. Uh, we have somebody right now that was an aerospace engineer. So you find out that there's all these other things and you're like, wait a minute, I know you're teaching geometry right now, but how would you like to teach manufacturing? Because in your previous career, you have all these skills. So it's amazing how many of those teachers you'll find that this is a second career and you can go get them a CTE credential because they actually have the content knowledge to be able to step into the classroom and teach manufacturing or teach mm -hmm. ag or something like that. So yeah, so um, then back to your, the next question, um, our kids have embraced it a lot. So by double dipping and by increasing the total number of pathways, you can see from where we were in 2016, 17, which I always say we took a large dip, but I always tell we were cleaning up our data. There was a little some issues with data, got it all clean and you'll see what starts happening. And then I, I always prefer instead of percentages, I love whole numbers. I love seeing that out of the 1700 ish kids that graduated last year from us, 1200 of them took a CTE course sometime. So all of our, not all of our kids, but 77% of our kids are getting at least one course that is talking about career, that is focused on career. So they are definitely gravitating towards this and they are enrolling. Yeah, and I mean, some of the, I would just jump in and say, you know, how do we track the kids? We're doing some cool stuff. I mean, some of our CTE has been around for, you know, 20 years. So we have, um, for example, print, you know, print, screen printing and embroidery. Construction. And, and construction. But I, I, was, I will say on the uh, Valverde Graphics, this is a student-run organization. They do screen printing and embroidery. The kids did $1.3 million dollars. Uh, worth of jobs last year. And the the biggest consumer of, of our students' work was other school districts in the area. So think about all of the uh, spirit packs and the spirit wear and the athletic gear. We're doing a lot of that in-house using our students. And the other thing that we have is like Southern California is a hotbed of screen printing. You think about some of the big labels that are on t-shirts and brands, that's all happening around us. So our students are learning how to use the automated pneumatic screen printing machines. And we've had them go to, to some of these big companies and they'll say, ah, you're just a kid. You know, how, how, you, you don't know how to operate the stuff where we're like, oh yeah, we have that same piece of equipment in my classroom. I absolutely do know how to do that. Um, I'll give you another example. We have our advanced cybersecurity and our advanced manufacturing students teaming up right now, not only coding, but building a drone uh, to be able to do certain things. And so we're taking kids from both of these programs, combining their experiences and giving them something concrete and tangible to solve in our local area where they're using, you know, again, their advanced manufacturing skills with the 3D printing, the CD, CNC machines, all that kind of stuff, and teaming it up with uh, the programming uh, that the kids are learning how to do. This is the kind of stuff that at least we found our students get super excited about uh, because they know that they're contributing to something that is solving a real world problem, and they aren't just reading about it in a textbook, they're actually doing it. Yeah, so well said. So, so let's let's play it out as a student. Let's say I'm a ninth grade student in Valverde. I'm starting to think about this kind of stuff. Do they look to self-select a pathway during those two years? What happens if they're in one for you know a, a period of time and they say, "Well, I'm kind of thinking I like this better." What does that look like from from their voice, their choice in that mix? So, student voice is is the number one thing that we're trying to give out, and we're trying to. Make them start thinking about it in middle school. So let's start talking about careers in middle school. What are we going to make that look like? So students do have the opportunity to choose the program that you want. 
And the, the other real cool thing is we actually give them the opportunity at some point, do you not like that pathway? I started in manufacturing, but turns out um, over here in the viticulture program where they were growing um, grapevines, which we do, um, maybe I want to do that instead. So I want to change. So you'll find of that number you saw earlier of the 1,200 that um, were participated, 340 of the 1,200 did not complete a pathway. And you think, well, that's a bad number. And I started diving into the number. What I found was that 340 that did not complete a pathway but participated changed pathways and took multiple classes. So what we're doing is we're giving them the opportunity to kind of dip their toe in the water and lots of different things for free, right? So once you get to college, if you want to change majors, that just cost, just cost you more money to completely shift gears in college, but here it's free. So kids are, are experiencing multiple pathways. They are selecting their own pathways and they select when they want to change their pathways. They can go to their counselor and say, I don't like this pathway. This is not the career I want to go. I would like to head in a different direction and they have the power to, to do so. So we would like that 340 to drop a little bit. So we'd love to get more completers, get more certifications, more industry certification. So we are currently working on these solutions. Make sure that we have middle school exploration. Let's send those kids. If they think they want to be in manufacturing, let's send them to a manufacturing plant. If they think they want to be a welder, let's send them to go see welders. Master schedule so that we don't have uh, singletons buttoned up against each other and getting counselors also on board with, which our counselors are fantastic. They are all on board with this, getting them to understand that we maybe we can keep some people in some pathways. So um, I love the fact that our kids have a chance to try pathways and self-select when they want to move on to other ones. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, it just, how much does that resemble real world? Like you graduate, you want to change your career, you want to change it, like you get to do it. So you're giving them opportunities to do that ahead of time. And I love that idea of, you know, just exploring even multiple pathways to say like, what do I want to do in life? And, and I think encouraging that's a great thing there as well. So let me ask you this question. If I'm a, if I'm a high school principal, middle school principal watching this, I'm a superintendent watching this. In all honesty, I may be shell shocked because like, I'm thinking like, how in the world are they doing everything that they're doing? You know, here we are, we're just trying to get by and you know, we've got a budget cut coming up and all those things that are very real. I'm not minimizing any of that, but where do they get started in something like this? What can a process look like? Obviously every community and, and, um, and district is going to be unique, but like talk to us about some specific strategies, techniques to just help them get st started a CTE program. Even so maybe they've got one pathway next year. What can that look like? Yeah, I'll just, um, I'll jump in and say to me, you know, it all starts with this local workforce needs assessment. What are the jobs available in the area? And, um, you know, kind of like the portrait of a graduate, I think this has to be a localized process where you're really reaching out to the local business community and you're saying, you know, what does our local economy look like? What does it depend on? And what is the, the skills that are needed to support our students moving into the jobs that are available in the local economy? And so that's, that's been huge. And then what do the district resources have? You know, that we hear a lot about, and we have one of these in, in our region where, you know, school district spent $30 million to create a STEM school. Well, we didn't have $30 million to create a, a STEM school. Um, but we knew that we wanted all of our kids to be able to access whatever we were doing. And so I think that depends a lot. You have to ask yourself, you know, what are the district resources? What's available? What kind of grant dollars might be out there? And, um, you know, then I think you, you look to, and, and I love the way Doug says it, and it's absolutely true. We find out that our teachers are much more than just teachers. Um, in some cases, they've come into a second career or they went to college and they actually got their degree in something different from what they're teaching in now. And um, see what your resources are, your human capital, what's, what's existing inside the system that you may not have had an idea. We actually uh, put a survey out to our staff and said, you know, what other skills do you have that you can bring to the table? And then I think, you know, what is it that, again, you go back to that labor market data for your local region and you say, okay, what, what, are, the what are the certifications that kids can earn and what's going to get them onto that career pathway? And finally, and this is something we think a lot about in Val Verde is we want to give our students options when they leave us. And so how do we expand those options, whether it be college right away, 
uh, and that could be a community college, which we absolutely recommend, could be four-year private uh, public institutions that they're going into, could be trade school, could be military as a great option uh, for us in our region as well. And so I think taking all those things into account, um, those are all the things that are kind of the touch points of where, you know, what you want to look at. But I'm also a big believer, you got to get into motion. Uh, it's kind of a Silicon Valley uh, attitude that we've adopted, which is get into motion, get something started, and then iterate on the program as you move along. And some of these programs don't require a huge initial investment, a huge capital investment. Like cybersecurity, for example. I mean, you could already have the computers in the system somewhere. It's a matter of finding that teacher. The kids are interested. I mean, you basically say, look, if you wanted to be able to hack the school district's uh, infrastructure, uh, take this class, and I guarantee you, kids will sign up. I don't know. I don't know if we should market it quite right now, <laughs> but, but yes, that's. Uh, turns out our IT department did not let us market it like that. The other thing I'll say, and <laughs> looking at that local workforce needs assessment, the your best friend should be the economic development team at your city. They know every business. They know every person you say, hey, I need to know something, they know who to call. So uh, we actually have two cities that are part of our district and I know them both. And we are always connected on what exactly are, because the, they are the ones who are asking those businesses, what do you need? They get me in the door. So that on that first one, that's where you start. Make, make friends with them, take them out to lunch, whatever you need to do, make it so that they respond to your phone calls, but they, that you need to have them in your back pocket. They're best for you. Yeah. So, so a couple of thoughts. Um, I hate to break it to you, Mike, but if I'm a superintendent watching this, my first call is going to be to Doug saying like, Hey, what is it going to take you to get me over here? So uh, you can come run the show for us. Um, but in, no, in all seriousness, the, the economic impact side of what you're talking about for your local community is just massive on so many levels, whether it's the things you're creating that you're not purchasing. So you're doing it obviously far cheaper than it would cost the district, but just, I'm thinking about the amount of businesses that you're partnering with and working with and and their moms or their dads and they're like, well, if I move to this community, my child can get these skills for free in practice, working here, doing this, and then when they graduate, have a job. And so like the economic impact and the cycle of the ability from that workforce pipeline is, is just massive. You know, workforce development, as I mentioned, is such a, a key aspect of our work at the Alliance for Excellent Education. And when I look at that, that, that cycle for families living in your community um, is just really dynamic. And again, kudos to that. That's that, that generational cycle that can really uh, take hold in communities just like yours. So let me ask you this, because I, I also understand if I, if I understand this correctly, you know, you're moving this to middle school and even look at an elementary school so having been an elementary principal like what does that look like and what do those pieces look like and why are you even doing it yeah so we we like this slide um, Google actually hired the economist group and so this this may not be uh, you know necessarily uh, shocking news for people but this is where the four C's come from and um, you know it's again, it's about those transferable skills and dispositions that will ideally be carried with students as they move into jobs that in some cases have yet to be create, uh, created, right? And so as industry and workforce moves around and changes, and of course we're certainly seeing a bunch of that with the, the pandemic now, is people are having to really reshape the way they're thinking about work. But if you have this skill set, uh, we think, this puts you ahead of most people. And so Doug, you wanna talk us through, uh, this is a framework that um, Doug really created um, that really is kind of personalized to each grade span. So Doug, I'll kick it over to you. Yeah, kind of the idea was we wanted to figure out how do we get these skills in our kids starting at kinder. So if we know our local workforce has certain demands, how do we, I always tell, this is what I always tell my local business partners, I've got 20,000 of your next employees. What do you want them to know? Tell me. So we kind of backwards map this entire thing of what it would look like all the way from kinder. So in kinder, we actually call it STEAM discovery. So notice that uh, the key words on there, they're solving problems. 
and they're using that engineering design principle. So getting kids to understand this is iterative. You're going to fail a couple of times. You're going to solve a problem. Keep at it. We're going to solve it. Some of the things that we use to it, and it's 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 iPads, it's engineering, it's 3D printers, it's it's Lego. Lego's a great uh, partner of ours that helps us a lot with engineering. Then grades three, five, we call it steam immersion, where we're now it's more complex problems. And now you're starting to get more into tying your math into it, tying your content into it. Let's get more, use your content to solve a problem. Can I use my scientific principles and my math principles to now go and solve a real world problem? Middle school, which is where we're spending a lot of time and money right now, is this application. So once you get this problem solving mentality, we spent six years from K-5 putting it all together. Now, how do we start actually applying that? This is what we're working on in middle school. The equipment that we're using is industry standard. So it is it is CNC mills, it is laser cutters, it is drill presses, it's band saws. I mean, it's, it's just tools upon tools of stuff that, that kids are gonna be using. They're now doing more complicated CAD design, computer-aided drafting design, the SolidWorks, 3D printers. Like I mentioned, the 3D printers were printing up things for our, uh, during this COVID shutdown, printing things for the hospitals. So they were designing them, students were designing them, teachers were printing them from home so we could donate. Then you see here, now we're gonna talk about career and entrepreneurship. So now we're saying, okay, now that you understand this problem solving mentality, how do you apply that to something that is now going to be what you would like to do for a job? So this is completely guided. So like it says there on tools, completely guided by what our local industry dictates. And then we get this question multiple times, have you eliminated pathways before? Yes, we have. So when the, when the local industry does not need a certain job anymore, we have eliminated those pathways, to make sure that we are responding to what our, our current local workforce needs. And then of course you see all the way throughout is our portrait of a graduate. This is, that was still the North Star that guided this entire thing was putting all those things together. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'm gonna go back and challenge that slide on the skills during this pandemic and say, the top skill should be like how to mute and unmute yourself on a Zoom call. And I, I think once we master that as a nation, like we should be all right with the next steps moving forward, right? So I so ask you like, you know, in all serious, and we could joke about that now, but like, you know, this, this global pandemic is obviously, you know, fear is out there, we're changing things overnight. I've got to ask, in a CTE, when I think of CTE and all the hands-on things that you've all been talking about, what does it look like in a remote setting? Because this isn't just, hey, like you've never designed anything, like just read this and answer this on a Google Doc, yeehaw, low level, we're done. What does it look like in remote? Give us an example or two of how you're doing it in the midst of a shutdown. Yeah, so that's so one awesome. of the skills, yeah, one of the skills to run these things all these things you see on the screen right here is, and the things you see here in, in the K-5, all of them require some coding. There are lots of coding resources that you can get to out there that are girls who code, code.org, our uh, Tinkercad is free, which is your CAD design software. There are lots of things that they are able to do on their Chromebook that are the exact same skills that our industry is gonna need, it just looks and feels like second grade. It looks and feels like sixth grade. Sorry, Mike, didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, I, I, I love that. I was just gonna go back to the example. I mean, we've even got some folks coming in on limited capacity, but to fire up the 3D printers and we've printed thousands of ear savers for the frontline medical uh, workers that, um, you know, as a little device that clips on the back of a mask so you don't have to hook it on your ears you can actually drape it around your around your around your neck using this this little device and you also hear you know a lot about uh, face shields being printed and things like that so I think you know but uh, there there are things that we've been able to continue to do but I also would circle back to to Doug's comment. So much of this is available and we're a one to one district. So I, I, we probably should have said that earlier. Uh, we've been a one to one take home district with Chromebooks uh, for several years now. Hence the dark fiber network that I talked about earlier on and the the inspiration to really build out the private LTE, LTE network for our students. And so when you when you're able to make a whole system commitment to get some of these tools into the kids' hands, 
And really that's been guided by this philosophy and equity. It, it's really about how do you provide the access and the opportunity so the kids have the Chromebooks at home. We distributed uh, for distance learning, we have our, our preschoolers have Chromebooks and we've had training for the parents because we figure at that point the Chromebook is probably more for the parents than it is for the students. But um, you know, the idea is that a lot of the programs that we're using in our career and technical education classes and our STEAM is right there on the on the Chromebook. Yeah, so well I think said. that the, the important part is that kids are still solving a problem. So they can solve a problem from home, home, sorry, create challenges, create opportunities for them to solve a problem, whether it's it's coding or it's using scientific practices or whatever it is, but that problem solving so that when they finally do get back to their classrooms, like our STEAM labs here that we've been building in the elementary that they still have that problem solving mentality and they can do some, uh, they can do some cool stuff when you give them the opportunity. Yeah, that's fabulous. And I think about, you know, the hardest CTE is really solving real world problems and how powerful for your, for your teachers and your pathways in it to say, look, like we're all in the midst of this global pandemic. We're going to alter this a bit and let's go solve some everyday real world problems in the work that we're doing. And so absolutely Absolutely. kudos to that. So, so final question for each of you, then we've got to run. We've got hundreds of people watching today, you know, each have their own reason for investing the time and hearing your story. What's one piece of advice you each have, you know, for those looking forward to CTE type work, no matter where they are in any sort of implementation. So Doug, what do you have for that? Um, My thing is, Get, get to know your local community and you're just going to want to get started moving on this thing and be patient. This takes years. This is my fourth year building these pathways and you see, don't try to bite off too much too fast. Just kind of roll your way in and it'll get better and better and better for a kid, but don't, don't wait. Your kids need this. Mike as the superintendent. What do you have? I say get into motion. You know, I, I always appreciate Doug's, uh, Doug's perspective on that, but Doug is so great with the relationships. And I think connecting with those economic development partners in your city and really taking a look at your uh, labor market data, that's going to really help you inform in your local context what are the pathways that you should be thinking about? You know, I love what Doug says. I'm going to steal his quote. He's, when, you know, when he meets, meets with our business partners, he says, look, I've got 20,000 of your future workers sitting in my organization right now. Tell me what it is that you need. And clearly we want kids to be able to read, write, and compute and be critical thinkers and all that. But what a powerful thing to say to your business and community partners. We've got workers right here. They may only be five right now, but we've got a long launch pad to get them ready to go, uh, which ultimately speaks to the economic vitality of the region. Yeah, absolutely. And I will say as we wrap up, gentlemen, I am amazingly impressed. Thank you for your commitment to equity. Thank you for your commitment to making sure that every child has every opportunity to the workforce in that regard. And thank you for the partnerships, because I know that everything you've shared today, there is so many aspects of blood, sweat, and tears behind making all of that happen and many sleepless nights. And so your work is truly to be commended because you're learner-centered and you want to provide those opportunities for kids. So thank you for that. I do want to remind our viewers that information on Future Ready can be found at futureready.org. And we encourage and challenge district superintendents like Mike to join over 3,400 others and sign the Future Ready pledge. Mike being one of those 3,400. I also want to encourage our viewers to get involved with our growing strands from district leadership to tech leaders, principals, librarians, instructional coaches, and school board members. We have vastly expanded the reach of Future Ready schools over the past few years. You can also check out our private Facebook groups for ongoing activities to stay connected. Um, for those that are working alongside of you throughout the nation. You can also find our brand new podcast, Leading Through Unprecedented Times, uh, that series on futureready.org slash podcast. I do want to take a moment to once again thank Mike and Doug, as well as thank all of you, our viewers, for joining us for this Future Ready webinar. And of course, a special thanks to our Future Ready partner, Konica Minolta, for making it possible. Don't forget to connect with us here at Future Ready on Twitter, Instagram, and on Facebook. If you missed any of today's conversation, it's going to be archived on our Future Ready Schools YouTube channel soon after this webinar. Thank you again so much for joining us here today at Future Ready. Have a fabulous day, and we'll see you next time.